welcome. My name is Alice Eckstein, and I'm the Director for Public Programs here. I'm delighted you're all with us tonight at the Center for Global Affairs. Um, so many of you are familiar to me, but I do see a few new faces, so if you'll bear with me, I'm just going to say a few things about who we are and what we do. Um, we just came back from last week's spring break lull, and as you've probably noticed, our halls are again busy with students on their way to graduate and non-degree classes, covering topics such as international law, economics, human rights, energy policy, security and peacekeeping, and development, among other topics. This room is in use almost every day of the academic year uh, with events such as these, which bring our academic community and public audience together to discuss today's most pressing issues. What binds us in and out of the classroom is the conviction that a global affairs education is really transformative. I expect that most of you know our host for tonight's conversation. Maybe you've read his thoughtful and comprehensive articles or listened to him in classrooms or previous public events. Professor Alon Ben Meir plays an important role here at the Center for Global Affairs. He teaches a course on the Middle East every semester in our non-degree program. He has taught courses as well on international relations and negotiation. He travels widely, he was, he was just away, uh, with a strong commitment to promoting a more peaceful world. And he is a frequent media commentator with the highest of academic credentials. Like all of his colleagues here at the Center for Global Affairs, he applies the practical lessons of his profession in the classroom. Because of his credentials and connections, he brings a truly impressive array of speakers to the center, including tonight's distinguished guest. Please join me in welcoming Professor Ben Meyer and His Excellency Gerard Arrault. Thank you. You know, I, I, must, I must tell you, I'm, we are truly delighted, very delighted to have Ambassador Aro with us tonight. And I wanted to know that because of the situation in the Middle East, the Ambassador will have to run back to the United Nations uh, even earlier than we normally stay here till about 8. Uh, so we're going to try to get to the point and, and uh, I'm going to even shorten my introduction <laughs> my <laughs> of this as Excellency. You know, uh, a moment ago we, we were talking I met with the ambassador some six months ago, seven months ago, something like that. And, uh, you know, I am the so-called expert on the Middle East. After having a conversation with him, I realized how much I don't know. Um, the truth of the matter is he's, he's true an expert. He knows the, the region because he served uh, first as a first secretary in Israel and, uh, and then became the ambassador of France in Israel. He served in NATO as a deputy uh, chief of the, of the mission uh, and, and um, an analyst and, uh, um, in, a, in a very high capacity in the foreign ministry in a number of different positions. And in many occasions, of course, he served as a, as a counselor and advisor on Middle East in, a, in the foreign ministry. Uh, uh, last three years, he was appointed to the United Nations as a permanent representative. And, and uh, honestly, considering what's going on in the Middle East, uh, we all should be feeling very fortunate that we have today with us an ambassador who will be able to shed some light about what's going on, specifically because France itself is playing a very significant role about what's going on in Libya. And, uh, and through our discussion, or through his, the, his Excellency presentation, we're going to find out what is really going on uh, at, this, at this juncture, uh, because n without any doubt, it is an historic um, uh, transformation that we are actually witnessing. So without further ado, and with a greater pleasure and honor, I introduce to you Ambassador Arab. Thank you very much, and uh, you know of this uh, op opportunity which is offered to me to, to address you. And uh, actually, yes, I'm sorry, I'm just rushing from the Security Council where we had our first meeting to present the, the results of the uh, air campaign in Libya to the, the members of the Security Council. Uh, so it was a bit, of course, a bit tense because when you are conducting military operations, you it's always a bit tense. It's the life of the soldiers, the life of the civilians. So it was. A, it's a bit a, a difficult period that we are going through. Um, when for a diplomat, it's very. It's not very easy actually to to explain what what he is doing. 
uh, if you are a mathematician, usually nobody is discussing mathematics uh, with you. So you can, uh, you know, you can really say that's mathematics, period. Unfortunately, with foreign affairs, everybody has an idea of foreign affairs. And in a sense, he's telling you, you should do that, that, and that, you know, really. And, uh, uh, and the problem here is to say uh, a diplomat and the, the man in the street and the citizen, uh, uh, we have two different views. Uh, and it doesn't mean that the citizen is wrong. It's simply that we have two different views. A country is in charge of, uh, a diplomat is supposed to defend uh, uh, the national interest of, of his country. Uh, and uh, the perception, I should say, of the national interest is what is, in, what is important. Uh, when you look at, at France, for instance, versus the Middle East, um, what are the national interests of my country? National interests are defined first by geography, uh, and then by history, and, and then by, uh, by the relative power of the country. Uh, it's obvious, and here I am stating a bit the obvious, that for France, Algeria, is much more important than for the United States. In a sense, what is happening in Algeria is a bit like what is happening in Mexico for you. So it means immediately that, by definition, France and the United States won't have the same policy in Algeria. They won't have the same policy in Algeria. Uh, simply because for us, what is happening in Algeria, but I could say, of course, the same thing for Morocco or Tunisia, it's an issue of national interest, of our direct national security. Uh, in our country, we have around, I guess, 3.5 million, 4 million uh, of people uh, coming from the Maghreb, living in France, for a population of 64 million of inhabitants. Uh, again, that's the parallel between Mexico, Central America, for you, and for us, the Maghreb. So that's, you know, so you have always to, 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 to remember that when things happened in the streets of Tunis, for instance, it has a very different significance in New York and in Paris. It has a very different significance. And when you are a French political leader, when, you know, it's really, it's, if something was happening in the, again, in the street of uh, uh, Cuba, of, uh, in a sense, we, we should hope something could happen in the streets of Cuba, it's obvious that it, it wouldn't have the same importance in, in, in Washington, in Miami, and in Paris. So you really, you have always to, to remember uh, uh, this very obvious point, very conspicuous point, uh, the first one. Second one is history. Uh, because I've, I've, I've insisted on the idea that unfortunately national interest is some, not something that you can assess in a sort of very intellectual way. Uh, we are uh, living, we are using human substance, which means we are living in the irrational world. And history is there, and, uh, and history is, is guiding uh, 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 the perception you have of your, of your own national interest, especially in my country, where history is an obsession. And uh, 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 you, you have a very different relationship to your history that we have. You know, it's really, it's something very striking for a foreigner arriving in the United States, that in a sense, you are a country of new beginning. You know, really, for you, history, whatever it has been, and you have had also dark sides in your history, is not a burden, you know, really, because in a sense, you said we are overcome and, and it's a new beginning. And while in my, in my country, we are carrying the burden of history again and, and again and again. So history is, is there, and again, uh, you can m even be more intellectual by saying history is different, as we have a, a different assessment of the significance of history. But we have an history. And for instance, nobody could explain why France has, I'm not going to say wasted, but has, at least has spent so many political uh, capital on Lebanon. You know, really, because if you want to say, I'm sure that you, a lot of them, a lot of you think, you know, the French are cynical or interested only by national interest, you will be totally unable to explain me why we have uh, spent, since the beginning of the Lebanese Civil War in 1975, we have spent so many, so, such a political capital to try, you know, really to preserve the independence of Lebanon. Really, but that's part of this sort of irrational side that we are all carrying for the French citizen, you know, Lebanon matters. Lebanon matters because it's not only because we have been, uh, uh, as you know, the mandatory power in Lebanon, because it was, after all, only between 1920 and 1943, uh, 46. Uh, it's really, it's, it's simple, simply that the French 
citizens uh, consider that uh, really we should take care, we should care for, for, for Lebanon. That's, that's also part of, of what a French diplomat has uh, uh, to, take, uh, to take into account. And third element, I should say, that's the, the relative power. You know, it's really, you have to take into account also the fact that uh, the United States, France, uh, Belgium, uh, they don't have the same power. Uh, which means that when you are supposed either to defend yourself or if you want to promote uh, your, uh, your interest, uh, you have to take into account your, uh, your, what you can do. Uh, what you can do. And, uh, and uh, the simple fact is the United States are spending 50% of the world military expenditure. You know, really, it's uh, uh, really so. It means that, by definition, you are by far, you know, by far uh, the first uh, military power. But uh, beyond any uh, understanding of, you know, in the world history, we have never known such a military superiority uh, uh, at any moment in the history. You know, really. So, in a sense, uh, you can uh, uh, you can afford doing things that really nobody can. Uh, and in a sense, France can for doing things that Belgium can't do. So you have also to, so to say, oh, these people are doing or not doing. Really sorry, we, we are doing what we can do. And, uh, and we can't do the same thing that you, uh, uh, the Americans, uh, are in a sense, uh, are, are doing. I've said also that we are talking in terms of perception. And, and here, uh, the fact is that we are democratic societies, the U.S. and France, which means that uh, uh, we are not living anymore in the time where foreign policy was decided uh, by uh, aristocratic diplomats uh, in, the, in the secrecy of the chanceries. Actually, uh, foreign policy is, is very much part of the diplomatic game, the public, uh, the public, the public debate. And here I come to the, the fact uh, uh, where we, we, we say, when I'm a diplomat and when people are telling me China, what, what I, I'm obliged as a diplomat to say to my political leaders, here are our interests. They are our values and our interests. And, uh, and so it's not cynicism to say that, you know, if you want to follow this policy, it has a cost in terms, for instance, of markets, in terms of exports. Uh, uh, jobs are a legitimate interest. It's not cynicism. You know, when you are uh, a president uh, uh, of a country, when you are in charge of foreign policy of your country, you have also to take care of what will be the exports of your country because exports mean jobs. Uh, so that's after that. So after that, it's to the political leader to make the arbitration because it happens that, of course, there are contradictions between, uh, uh, between both, uh, both of them. So that's the part of uh, and the, the, the democratic, democratic game, the media, the NGOs, uh, and the human rights defenders who, who are all the time, of course, criticizing the diplomats, in a sense, they're right. They are, you know, it's part of, there is a, a sort of, I should say, the democratic game, and, and at the end of the day, the democratic, there is a democratic uh, decision uh, making, uh, making process. Uh, so it's, it's, and I give very, very often I give this, this, this example um, because people think, uh, usually the, the Americans think that the French are cynical, have a cynical uh, foreign policy, but uh, you have to be reassured the French are convinced that the Americans have a cynical uh, foreign <laughs> policy, uh, but a sort of, with a sort of uh, Protestant good conscience. You know, well, that's the difference that we see. Uh, uh, in a sense, the French and the, and, the, and the Americans are right. You know, it's, it's not cynical. We, are, we have a foreign policy. We are defending our, our national interest. And the role of the NGOs, the role of the political parties, is, in a sense, is to push for their, for their, ide for their ideas uh, and, and, and for defending the, some, the values. And on these issues, I'm very, as a diplomat, I've, I've, I don't think there is a good answer about human rights. Uh, in the Middle East, I, I think we have to be very modest, all of us, the French, the Americans, and the other ones, uh, because we see, in a sense, what is happening today. We had a clear choice without that we, we were making the choice of stability. In a sense, we, we, we thought that the choice was between authoritarian regime and, uh, and fundamentalist uh, uh, victory. 
uh, and uh, we made the choice. Uh, we decided that we, we should uh, choose the first term of the, of the alternative. Uh, here, something is, is uh, happening totally new in the streets of Tunis, in the streets of Cairo, and also maybe in Syria and Yemen, where you have people which are not, who are not uh, anti-American, who are not uh, fundamentalist, but simply are asking for, uh, for, for democracy. Uh, so I think it w it's a good example or, of uh, calling us to, 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 to modesty. Uh, in, this, uh, in this very difficult uh, region. And I should insist to the fact that nobody has an answer. Nobody has an answer. It's very, fr you know, it's really, when you read the French newspaper, everybody is saying that the French authorities behaved in an awful way. Uh, when you read the British newspaper, they say that Mr. Cameron behaved in an awful way. And when you read the American newspapers, it's the same thing at the expense of President Obama. Uh, I think nobody, no country, no leader, uh, uh, actually could, uh, could pretend or, or could pretend that he has been really very successful. And in a sense, it, we can't be successful because we have to admit immediately the limitations of our influence. You know, what is really, frankly, even the American influence on, on what is really happening in, this, in, this, in these countries? It's, it's, it's limited. We have a limited influence because as soon as you lift the finger, you are immediately accused of interference. I, I give you the example of Maghreb, uh, because it's my, uh, in a sense, is, of course, as the former colonial power, as soon as we say a word, uh, 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 you know, we are immediately accused of colonial interference. And, and some regime in the Maghreb, uh, especially one of them, is very good at it. And is extremely very good at it, you know, because we had a difficult time and a difficult divorce and is immediately uh, accusing us of, of interfering and trying to associate a democratic protest with uh, uh, the colonial interference. So it means also that we have to be, uh, uh, we have to be extremely careful in the handling, uh, in the handling of, of the crisis. I don't give you answers, you know, really, uh, because first uh, I think uh, only silly people have answers to questions. Uh, you know, really, I've been in Israel and I know that when you ask a question on, on the Talmud, uh, the answer is always a question. <laughs> so I, I really, I've, I have learned in Israel, I've spent five years and a half in this country, so I've learned that to avoid to give clear answer to, to, to questions. No, uh, the, the, the Middle East for, for France, for obvious geographic reason, it's across the street. It's across the street the Maghreb, but uh, for also human reasons, because we have uh, the second uh, Jewish community in the world. Uh, we have uh, also, we have the first uh, uh, Muslim community in Europe. Uh, we, we don't make, you know, every country has its own fads. Uh, our, uh, ours is to refuse ethnic statistics. We consider ethnic statistics are, 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 are close to discrimination, but we, we, you can think that we have, I guess, on 64 million of inhabitants, something like 4.55 million of Muslims. Um, we have, uh, the, so uh, we have a long, long history, a long, long history uh, with this part of the world coming from the Crusaders. Uh, it's not something that you should remind these days, but uh, coming from the 11th uh, centuries, we have been colonial powers in, Ma in the, um, the free countries of the Maghreb, in Syria, in, 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 in Lebanon. Uh, so, for all these reasons, we are, in a sense, we are obliged to have a, 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 Middle, East, a, a Middle East policy. And our Middle East policy is the Middle East policy that, you know, uh, it's not, uh, I think, by chance that for the last 52 years, uh, I guess, uh, we have had more or less the same for, uh, policy in the Middle East. Uh, you can have nuances, you know, you can say, oh, there are nuances, there are sensitivities, or you have presidents who, when they arrive, they want to change the policy. And after six months, or after one year, uh, you know, they are back to the tracks. You know, really, they're, 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 they're really, our interest is very simple. It's, it's stability and peace. Really, how to get uh, uh, stability and peace and to have good relations uh, with the country, including oil producing countries. You know, really, it's, we don't have uh, as good relations that you have with Saudi Arabia, for instance. Uh, but uh, we have good relations with also the, the, this, part, uh, this part of, uh, of the world. 
well, I, sorry to have been a bit discursive. I was supposed to write down something, but no, again, right, our <laughs> Colonel Moir Mar Kadhafi has uh, a bit. Uh, You're perfectly fine. Thank you so much. I think there's a, a, one big hand to start with. No, you don't need it. <laughs> you don't need it. <laughs> you know, you have so many questions yeah. uh, that I wanted to, to ask you. Actually, I feel I feel like the mosquito who came across a new colony and said, "Boy, where shall I start?" <laughs> <laughs> Um, um, Your Excellency, the, the, when you, you mentioned something, you know, that obviously France has, has a different kind of interest, specifically when it comes to the Maghreb, of the Middle mm -hmm. East. And uh, France was very um, willing and able to, in the case of Libya, to charge ahead and say that something mm -hmm. has to be done. And France, France, in many ways, took the lead in trying to push for the no-fly zone. What is specifically your interest in Libya? I think it, it's it's a very good uh, it's a very good question because you know we are uh, as human we are human beings and we know that when we take a decision uh, we don't have one, only one reason to take a decision yeah, really and uh, to take such a decision there are several reasons that you can find uh, and again human beings you have noble reason and less noble reasons you know we are democracies you so you have a lot of reasons and. Uh, uh, so you can argue in terms of domestic political life in France, you know, we are entering, like you are, actually uh, 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 a year towards a, a presidential election. So you can have, you know, and uh, when you look at the French press, the, in a sense, there, there were a lot of, of, of different arguments. I, my my uh, uh, conviction has always been that what, what matters is not why you do it, but that you do it. Uh, really, and so it's a personal decision by the president of the of the republic. It's really, uh, I think there were um, there were again maybe compared to the U.S. Uh, in I think in, in Europe and not only in France but in Europe, of course, uh, because of the closeness. You know, I was arguing that it's like Cuba uh, for Libya for us. It's it's Cuba. Uh, there was uh, really in the public opinion uh, uh, there was a strong reaction. And, and we were facing the, the, prospect, uh, the prospect of having a bloodshed in Benghazi. It was very close to Benghazi. Uh, and uh, uh, what happened really on the, on the spot was that we have one of these uh, so-called French intellectuals uh, who came to Benghazi uh, and came back from Benghazi in a sense to and met uh, Nicolas Sarkozy, the president, and simply with Libyans who told him, you know, Benghazi is going to fall in 24 hours. Benghazi is going to fall in 24 hours. Yeah, no, but besides Benghazi, obviously, uh, had there not been no interference yeah. by, by air to begin with, yeah. Benghazi might have fallen. Yeah. But, but just going back to your uh, central, central theme, uh, France has an interest in the Middle East, has interest in the yeah. Maghreb, uh, and the no-fly zone now is in yeah. effect. Uh, the United States has uh, already said it openly yeah. that it wants to pass on command to s European communities in one form or another. Where do you see this going? Where do you see the end game at this, at this juncture? Is there an end game? I've, I have, you know, really, if I was a bit late, it's because I, I had a stakeout uh, when leaving the Security Council. So I avoided very carefully to answer to this question, you know, really to, uh, <laughs> to uh, dozens, of, uh, dozens of journalists. You know, I'm going to, to look very, very old. It's, I think it's more or less in my career, it's my fifth or sixth war that I am following as a diplomat, not as a soldier. And, and what is really striking is, you know, it's only in the, in the books that you think you have, you decide what is my political goal and what are the military means, the strategy to reach this political goal. It never happened this way, you know, really. Uh, usually, uh, so one morning, uh, uh, you wake up and that's war. And uh, uh, Kosovo, you know, I, I, I really, uh, the Kosovo story is, is illuminating because simply we started to send uh, warning shots, warning missiles at Milosevic. And I was at, the, at NATO at the time. And I can tell you, we were all of us, we were convinced that Milosevic would cave in after three or four missiles. He didn't. And suddenly we were obliged either us to cave in or to go into the escalation. Nothing was prepared. There was no planning. It was a total surprise. 
And I think uh, uh, that's, that's something very striking. In a sense, on Saturday morning, you know, really the French planes started to, to bomb. Uh, of course, the journalists, because we are the French, the journalists believe that it was through some uh, uh, quest for glory, or I don't know why, I don't know what. It was simply that because the, the people in Benghazi called us and said, in 12 hours, it's over. But that, but so that that's reason, no, but okay. I said, so that's reason, in a sense, uh, that the planes were sent, we rushed, but I, I should very clearly th that our goal is to let the Libyan people to make, uh, uh, to make their choice, their political choice. How we are going there, you know, we have still not, uh, and I'm not saying the French, but all the coalition, we have still not determined uh, the common structure. Try to imagine, we are three, four days, we, don't, we still don't have a common structure. Uh, we are negotiating to have a common structure. Uh, it's, it's a lot of improvisation. We are totally, in, in a sense, and war is very often an improvisation. Yeah, but the, the, this is the concern that, that we have, and what, but, and what we, mm. when we read and see in the discussion, uh, various levels in government, level, mm. in the media, the, the concern we have today is that now that the campaign has started, mm. Uh, by all uh, accounts, there is absolute, from my perspective, and having talked to mm. so many, Gaddafi can no longer stay in, yeah. in power. Now, do you feel that air campaign alone is going to achieve that objective? How are we going to do so without some kind of boots on the ground? And who no. is going to provide them? Uh, you know, you, you should not ask this question to me because I was in Israel in 2006 when some, uh, the first uh, Air Force officer was chief of staff of the, it was the first time it was an Air Force officer, was the chief of staff of Sahal, uh, convinced the prime minister that actually could win the war by using Air Force, only Air Force. And, and we know the, the result. It was a, a, a real failure. Are you referring and to 2006, 2006 in Lebanon? Exa exactly. Okay. July. Yes. And at the end, the Israelis were obliged, of course, to send uh, infantry. Um, no, here, we, what we have, uh, that's of course a legitimate question. You have the Benghazi people, and you have the Libyan people. Uh, so the Benghazi people were going to be crushed, uh, that to be defeated. Now they are not going to be defeated. So, uh, so you can argue that uh, the infantry, uh, which means, which is going to decide the fate of Libya, they are the Libyans, uh, the Libyans, you know, themselves. That's the first. The second one, and again, I'm, I'm ready to accept the, uh, your, your answer that my answer is half satisfactory. Uh, the, second <laughs> one, <laughs> the second one, uh, uh, the second is the idea of a, pol a political process. So we had the first meeting of the Security Council after the beginning of the crisis, and around the table, a lot of countries were saying, where is the political track? Where is the political track? Because as you can guess, in the Security Council in the United Nations, there is a, a lot of uneasiness about the idea of, uh, in a sense, taking side in the civil war uh, and interfering directly into internal affairs. But, but on this point, uh, Mr. Ambassador, this is exactly the point. If it remains uh, an American-European operation, the Arab states, many are going to say, mm -hmm. here we go, we go again colonialism, once again. I, what are the efforts that are being currently made to reach out for other Arab countries to take part in this, for example, Egypt, Tunisia, Tunisia itself, Qatar volunteered to do something, uh, Morocco, who who's, hasn't been uh, as yet in, uh, affected as much, particularly because the Moroccans have begun their own reforms going back a number of years, and uh, so they've been doing something for the people much earlier. What efforts are being made just right now to reach out for some of the Arab states to, so that, to give this campaign also an Arab face, not only European or American face? No, I think first, uh, again, if we, if we are Egyptian, uh, uh, if you look at what is happening in Libya from Egypt, your conclusion is I, I, I won't interfere. Uh, because from an Egyptian point of view, you know, they have more than, still more than one million of Egyptians living in Libya. Uh, and it's their border, uh, so it means that it's a country which could have a uh, very uh, direct and negative uh, influence on their security. So I sh should say that the Egyptians uh, uh, you know, are very prudent, and I should uh, think that Tunisia uh, is reacting the same way. No, for the moment we have two countries which are committing uh, means, which is uh, the uh, Qatar and the uh, uh, United Arab Emirates. Uh, we are 
uh, the Americans, the French, the British, you know, we are discussing with other, uh, with other Arab countries. Uh, there is, uh, unfortunately, at the same time, there is the Bahrain story, which is um, in itself a problem, but it's also an embarrassment in the relationship between the, the U.S. and uh, some uh, Gulf countries which consider that uh, the U.S. have been a bit too vocal about what happened in Bahrain. So it has been uh, uh, not an impediment, but at least it has been a problem that we have, we have to solve. But even if we have two, three, four Arab countries, it's obvious that if the campaign lasts, uh, uh, there will be problems in the public opinions. Not only in the public opinions of the Arab countries, but also in the public opinions of European countries. Because, you know, collateral damage is an awful expression because it means civilian ki civilians killed. And whatever you are doing, whatever, uh, however car careful you are, and of course we are very careful uh, to avoid uh, civilian casualties, it's impossible to avoid civilian casualties. Let's be frank, war is war. And so there will be, there, are, there will be uh, civilian casualties by, of course, uh, by accident. Uh, so, again, I think w our strong interest is to find as quickly as possible, for human reasons, but also for political reasons, to, to find a, a political track. Yeah, but so on Friday, you have the meeting of the uh, African Union in, uh, uh, in Addis Abeba. Uh, they have, uh, the African Union, they have invited the five permanent members, they have invited the Arab League. So there will be certainly an idea of of an of of political track political but, negotiation. But now that the France has has begun this campaign, and uh, let's say if you were to be asked, please uh, draw for us a scenario. Uh, what is going to happen a month or two or six weeks down the line? What do you see? What do you see happening three four weeks down the line? Well, frankly, I'm uh, again I've I've reached the age where I am a, a bit too repeating to my young diplomats, you know, really saying oh. Again, I, I, I really am very, I, I'm, I'm not trying to, to avoid an answer. I don't know. It's a war. <laughs> it's a serious. So every, it's impossible to forecast what will be tomorrow. You know, so, uh, tomorrow uh, a missile is falling on Gaddafi. Tomorrow a missile is falling on a school. You know, you can imagine immediately incidents uh, uh, or tomorrow you have a representative of the African Union going to Benghazi and Gaddafi says, I accept a ceasefire. But, but so it's really, so you can have a very different. My preferred scenario would be to have uh, 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 elections free, fair, uh, which means mon internationally monitored elections in Libya, allowing the Libyans to choose their leader. Uh, their leader, including Gaddafi, if they want. We do think on a national basis that, frankly, Gaddafi uh, can't be part of the problem. No, but but do you really do you, do you really think this is possible at all? I mean, to consider to, to go for an, an election when Gaddafi is still in place. I mean, is that uh, conceivable at all? Oh, you know, everything is conceivable. Well, I, I, well, I, I mean, no, I, no. But I, again, I think <laughs> I think it's. Uh, 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 let's look. What is going to happen on the ground will be certainly critical. Uh, what will be the capabilities of the, the people, I call them the people of Benghazi, let's, um, or the insurgents, or, uh, you know, it's in this country, it's a noble world, uh, a noble world. Uh, so the insurgents or, or the people, uh, are they going to be able, uh, with the help, let's be clear, the help of our uh, uh, Air Force, the Air Force of the coalition, I'm not talking about the French one, the, Air Force of the coalition, are they going to be able to topple down uh, to topple down Gaddafi? That's the first question, and that question that I don't have the answer by definition. You know, really, I don't have the answer. Secondly, uh, will the people around Gaddafi, the tribe of Gaddafi, uh, the people around Gaddafi, are going to consider that it's better for them if they have some guarantee to get rid of Gaddafi, or no? Are they going to? Uh, are they going to, to, to stonewall around, around Gaddafi or simply to give up Gaddafi in exchange of uh, some, some guarantees? That, that's another, you know, that's really a, 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 another question. So you can have a lot, a lot of very different uh, hypotheses and leading to very different results. And you can have the dark scenario, uh, which means Gaddafi resisting in the West uh, and the people in the East unable to, 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 uh, to roll him back. Uh, and, and the war dragging along, and it will be a negative, a very negative scenario. Negative scenario, of course, are possible. But how do you see France playing, uh, you know, suppose this is a scenario that will unfold, 
where do you see prawns going? And let me just uh, back up a bit and ask you the following. Suppose the United States eventually does hand a command to NATO. And then there's uh, still between you, Britain, certainly Germany doesn't want to really get much involved in all of this. But there's de de definitely an issue between Britain, France, uh, perhaps even Spain to some extent. Uh, you know, who is going to assume leadership? I, mean, I think it will be NATO. I think at the end of the day it will be uh, NATO, at least for the no-fly zone. It will be, uh, it will be NATO. No, the, the debate, w which was in a sense, uh, as usual, uh, a bit misrepresented by the press, was that we had, with the French, actually, as you may know, or, um, President Sarkozy, you know, brought back France towards the military structure of NATO that we left in 1967. So it was, in political terms in France, it was quite a decision, which was a real pro-NATO decision, and not that popular. He did it. So he can't be accused of being anti-NATO. Now, the idea was that uh, it was not a very good idea of having NATO in Libya, very clearly NATO, or not in Libya, I guess, on Libya, flying over Libya, that uh, NATO is such a symbol of the West, uh, of the Christian, uh, the, the Christian coalition of the West, uh, in a war where we didn't want to appear as the West versus the, the Arab world. So it was more in terms of political and symbolic aspects. So there was a political debate about it. So I guess that, uh, but we have reached, since the Americans are, are, are in a sense, for the moment the Americans are uh, ensuring the more or less are uh, the common structure uh, on the ad, ad hoc basis, but I think that at the end, I guess that we will we'll reach the, the conclusion uh, that we are going to use NATO but for the no-fly zone, for for the military strikes, for the air strikes. Maybe it will be a different. But structure. in this regard, if it's going to be NATO, Turkey is a member of NATO, yeah. and we know now there is quite a bit of tension between the France yeah. and, and Turkey. Uh, in terms of Turkey's complaining, we are a member of NATO, we haven't been participating, mm. uh, we have not been part of the decision-making process, albeit we are an effective member of NATO with the largest standing um, uh, army actually within, within NATO, um, uh, uh, you know, structure. Uh, how are we going to, and then there's also the personal relationship between Sarkozy and Erdogan, which is really not terrific from what we see and hear. Uh, how do are you? Is there any negotiation, any talks now between France and Turkey no, it's in not, this connection? No, because you know Turkey. Uh, the problem of Turkey is not linked to to France. There are some problems in the world which are not linked to France. A few, but uh, really, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, really, and unfortunately, because we want to to consider ourselves as the center of the world, but uh, <laughs> there are some problems which don't depend on us. No, the problem of Turkey was the main problem of Turkey beyond these squabbles was. Uh, the problem of bombing uh, uh, a Muslim country, you know, really basically. Well, that's, that's the point, exactly. That's the point. And it's done so by way, another Western power. So it was, it was, exactly, it was uh, the problem we have, uh, we are, uh, uh, with Turkey, there is a major geopolitical shift uh, under the military dictatorship and in the Cold War, uh, uh, Turkey decided that it, it was uh, a Western country. It was the best ally of the West against uh, communism and against uh, the, the the Soviet Union has collapsed and uh, uh, the military uh, dictatorship has collapsed and uh, the Turks are discovering that actually uh, they are a country of the Middle East they are Muslim countries uh, they have a long history in the Middle East so that it was uh, uh, their, their foreign policy was a bit a lobotomy you know there was part of their brain who had been artificially cut so you have the normal Turkey which is back Turkey as a Muslim country, and it's not insulting a country, you know, you say Italy is a Christian country, a Roman Catholic country, that's with a tradition, with an imperial tradition, the Ottoman Empire, uh, and they have national interest. Uh, so it's normal that they have some reluctance uh, to, you know, they had the reluctance uh, versus Iraq, in Iraq, but they have the reluctance also in Libya to see the West versus. So there are, there are debates, but not between France and Turkey, it's between Turkey and all the other members but was of NATO. It, was any effort being made, however, in advance that is, since Turkey is a member of NATO and being a Muslim, should be uh, should be, should have been um, much quicker, much more uh, part, part and parcel of what's taking place. So Turkey is a Muslim country, and I understand from Turks that I spoke with 
they were um, very upset about what's going on in, in Libya, and they would have liked to participate. That's what I'm told. Is that, is there any merit to that? Well, actually, if there is a NATO strike, if it's a NATO operation, and I guess to, today, I think it should have been decided in Brussels as a NATO operation, it will be conducted, it will be led from the Air Force, the NATO Air Force uh, command, command, which is in Turkey. So it means that, the Tur and as you know, in, in NATO, all the decisions are taken by consensus, so Turkey will be. Uh, uh, but the problem is, uh, our Turkish friends have to be also fair. Uh, they have not been invited to Paris to the meeting which decided the operation, because at the time they were against the military operation. So you don't invite somebody who is against the military operation to a place where you are supposed to decide well, that the was the operation. They conducted in the name of NATO. That is, France no, 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 went they, on its own. No, no, they were pretty no, much no. With, with the United States. No, no, but at the time they were against the military operation. And, and after that, I, sorry, I know, sorry. But the deliberation in themselves were not handled or were not conducted under NATO umbrella initially. No, no, is but uh, even in NATO they were blocking everything. The Turks were blocking everything in NATO. Uh, I think two days ago the Turks have blocked uh, the adoption of the, uh, the, pla the plan for the no-fly zone. So the Turks, you know, the, the Turks have, have negotiated uh, a sort of turnaround because in the beginning they were against any military operation, including for NATO. And now, you know, there is a sort of turnaround and they, they are back to the idea of not, the, and they say, we are ready to go to no-fly zone, but not airstrikes. So that's also one of the reasons, the problems that we have to solve, sorry to be a bit technical, because in the resolution you have two things, military terms, a no-fly zone, you prevent uh, planes to fly, and airstrikes uh, that to defend the po civilian population. And the Turks are ready to go to the no-fly zone, but not to the airstrikes. So it's, again, it's, uh, uh, it's not that easy. We, we, we are, uh, uh, in French we say that you, 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 you learn uh, to swim by, by, by uh, diving into the water. Uh, it means that we are, uh, we are trying to figure out what is this operation. We have not, I think it's, it's a, a big first. Uh, I think in the history of, of the international relations, you don't have a lot of, of examples where suddenly you intervene in a civil war, you take side on one side of the civil war, and you do it in a few hours uh, with very different countries, and you do it at the request of the Arab League. Don't forget that we are intervening in Libya, which is quite spectacular. But the, the, Arab League, Arab League. Uh, the Arab League actually supported the no-fly zone. Were they at the time they were not talking about bombing? Yeah. Actually, well, I mean, is that, was this, is, uh, this a distinction? Well, no, 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 from no. their perspective. No, no. If you read the the, 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 the statement by the Arab League, they they, are, they were requesting two things. One was the no-fly zone, and the secondly was the creation of safe areas and humanitarian corridors to protect uh, the civilian. Uh, so, what our argument? And it has not been discussed by the Arab League. Our argument is that the airstrikes are, uh, are a way of creating safe areas, which That's means right. places, right. you know, really it's... Uh, and, and again, no, the problem of the Arab, the Arab countries, uh, I think it's, you have to understand, first, there is the hovering cloud of Iraq. You know, really, the West is not the most popular uh, I guess, uh, image because of Iraq, you know, really. And uh, so they don't, don't want Iraq revisited. You know, really, and when Tomahawk started to fall on, on Benghazi, it was quite a shock for a lot of Arabs because suddenly they were back to the nightmare of 2003. You know, really. So you have to understand this point of the, on the Arab side. On one side, they hate Gaddafi; they want to get rid of Gaddafi. On the other side, there is this sort of gut feeling. You know, really, again, Iraq revisited. So, so it's 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 difficult also for 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 their leaders. Second point. Most of their leaders have, have other concerns. You know, they have other problems to to to, to handle. And uh, so I think, and again, they, are, they have declared it. They have made several declarations, including the organization of the Islamic countries. Actually, has made declaration. They want to. They consider that Qaddafi, I quote them, is not legitimate anymore. Uh, and and they are. They have requested the UN resolution 1973 at. At the Security Council, there is always one Arab country, which is Lebanon for the moment, and Lebanon was the most forceful advocate uh, uh, for Resolution 1973, and Lebanon voted Resolution 1973, of course. So again, there are problems in the street. Uh, the public opinion has mixed feeling about the idea. As I said, Gaddafi out, but well, 
uh, tomahawk on Benghazi, you know, really, so. Well, I obviously, you know, um, I mean, you said it yourself, but it's hard to um, uh, write now to envision what's going to happen necessarily two or three weeks down the line. So let me sort of leave Libya for a little bit. Uh, what, what we are seeing today in the Middle East is in a sweeping uprising that it is, has gone far beyond Libya, uh, before Libya and probably following the, what's, what's going to happen in Libya. Where do you see this uh, uh, wave of uprising of the Arab street against their respective government is going? What, how, it's going to, how long is it going to last? What is going to happen? Can you take one or two examples from your perspective? No, I think here you're asking me to have a crystal ball. And no, no, no. To, uh, of course, I don't know <laughs> I by mean, definition. In terms of observation, uh, I mean, uh, if once I'm asking me what I can make three or four observations yeah. in terms yeah. of how long this, this is not going to last months, probably perhaps years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, this is the kind of, where do, where do you see that's going? You know, it's really, when, when there was the, the first, uh, first uh, uprising, you know, the fall of Ben Ali in Tunisia, we have uh, sent cables to the French embassies in the, in the Arab world to ask them, is it possible in your country? You know, really, what is happening? And the answer was, all the ambassadors were <laughs> answering, it's different here, <laughs> you know, really. In a sense, they were right, uh, but they were wrong also, <laughs> obviously. Uh, which means that, uh, it, it, because it's, it's a common cultural uh, as, uh, area, you know, really, which means that through the, through the television and, uh, and also the fact that most of the regime are authoritarian, uh, through internet, uh, what is happening in Arab country has immediately an echo in other Arab countries. Uh, there is an identification, you know, they are the same singers, they are looking at the same movies, uh, Al Jazeera, Al Arabiya, the TV, they are now you have common, you have, uh, you have TV, so it has uh, obviously an echo. But at the same time, the situation are, are quite different. Uh, between a country like Morocco, where you have, uh, in a sense, a regime which, is, which has uh, the religious legitimacy because the king uh, is a religious leader, uh, the, the historic legitimacy because the, the dynasty is 300 years old, uh, the national legitimacy because the king was, uh, in a sense, the liberator of the country against the French colonial power, and also because here you have, uh, uh, you have the, the society has not been destructured by oil, uh, the oil money, there was no oil money, which was at the same time a blessing uh, in disguise because in a sense it, it didn't bring with it, you know, the, the, the destruction of the, the economic structures. In Morocco you still have an agriculture, you still have, you know, you know, some of you know, uh, you, you have an economy, a, a traditional economy. It's a poor country, but you have still a, a, a working economy. And the king has decided uh, in a very shrewd way uh, to try to, to play uh, democratic reform. So here you have, you have demonstrations in, in Morocco, but you can argue that, again, maybe I'm, I, I'd be wrong, and, uh, but you can argue that the, 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 the system, the political system, is able to face the challenge. Uh, that's, uh, that's a, uh, on the other side, you have Yemen, and, uh, or Bahrain. Bahrain is an impossible situation. You have a majority which is Shiite, 60, 70 percent of the population, and you have uh, uh, the monarchy which is a Sunni monarchy. Uh, and uh, uh, so there is a sort of sense that if you go to democracy, it will happen to what happened in Iraq. You know, you have to understand that for a lot of Sunni regimes, uh, what the Americans did by invading uh, Iraq was to give Iraq to the Shiites. Pretty much. Uh, really, That's a lot of Sunni will tell you, Sunni regime will say that invasion of Iraq was, was a gift to Iran. To Iran, yes. That, uh, that the American soldiers fought for Iran. That's their, the interpretation. But you have, because the, the, the rift between Sunni and Shiites is a very important rift in the, in the Middle East. And you have a Sunni world which, in a sense, feels, rightly or wrongly, it's not to us to judge, they feel threatened by a sort of uh, a move forward of the Shiites in Iraq. Iraq, you know, really, it's, it's quite a thing. You know, Iraq was considered for 1,000 years as the border between the Shiite world and the Sunni world. Right. The border uh, has fallen. Uh, it's, uh, the Shiites, you know, really have taken the power. Uh, you have also in Lebanon. In Lebanon, with the, the, the power of the Hezbollah, the Shiites are more and more powerful, and the fall of the Prime Minister Hariri has been seen all over the, this part of the world as a victory of Hezbollah against a Sunni Prime Minister. 
so you have to, to understand that there is a, f a feeling of, of, of fragility uh, uh, among the Sunni, uh, the Sunni leaders, which make them so nervous about, about Bahrain. Yes, and for good reason, yes. And, and, and the, it's a problem, because on one side, you can, you have, uh, we have our values, which is the values of democracy, and you say, uh, really, uh, you have to be on the side of uh, the, 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 the Shiites in Bahrain, on, 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 the, you know, on behalf of democratic values. But you have also to take, and here I'm the diplomat coming, you have also to take into account this geopolitical reality, uh, that the fall of the regime in Bahrain will be seen, and in a sense will be, a victory of Iran. Uh, and will be, you know, will be a destabilizing effect for a lot of countries in this part of the world where you have Shiite minorities. But isn't this the, the, the problem with this administration here, specifically President Obama? Initially, he wanted to support the reformers of Bahrain, knowing only too well that the majority of citizens of Bahrain are Shia, not Sunni. And if there were to be an election tomorrow or next month, uh, free and fair, Without any question, the Shiite will be uh, in the government. They will, they will be the, form, the one to form the government. Now, on the other hand, there is the Iranian threat. There's American strategic interest. We have a, a naval bases there. Uh, we, uh, the Arab state, uh, at least the Gulf state, are terrified from, from Iran just as much as anyone else for that, for that matter. Why is it that the United States, for that matter, Europe, the European community, are not being honest about this approach and say, listen, you know, not uh, we can't treat every country the same. And President Obama, I think, made a horror, uh, ban, I mean, I should say, um, uh, I President don't Bush. endorse what he's going no, to no, say. Uh, yeah. like, <laughs> what do you think I was going to say? <laughs> I'm going to test you. <laughs> <laughs> but the truth is, you know, our inability to articulate what it is our interest. And it so happened that uh, America's interest, uh, European interest in the Gulf happened to be coincide and it's consistent with the Gulf state just the same because of their concern about Iran. But you can fall, uh, here we can fall into the same trap that we have fallen in, in, in Egypt or in Tunisia by uh, privileging stability. Uh, actually you have stability but at the end you have chaos because stability uh, through force uh, in a sense is not real stability. I, I do remember when I was a young diplomat, there was a, a head of state which was a, who was a sort of a bloody dictator in, in Congo, which Mobutu. And every, when I was going to the, our uh, Africa desk, uh, I was really saying Mobutu, and immediately all my Africa, African, Africa desk friends were saying it's Mobutu ou le chaos, Mobutu or chaos. And I, yeah. I was telling them, you'll have Mobutu and you'll have the chaos. It's Mobutu and the chaos. So that's the reason, the problem also that we have to, to take into account is authoritarian regimes, uh, uh, unqualified authoritarian regime, unmitigated, uh, unreconstructed uh, 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 authoritarian regimes, at the end of the day, bring st instability. You know, when you are in a, in a country, I'm not talking of any country, country, let's imagine, when you have a country where there is no possible opposition, that all the oppos opposition parties have been, the secular opposition party have been destroyed, where you see that the regime is ineffective, uh, authoritarian and corrupt, I don't give names, really. Uh, when you are young, you are 30 years old, you are not the son of the general or the prince, your choice is very clear. There is the only opposition possible is the mosque. You know, it's very clear. You know, the best ally of the fundamentalist is the authoritarian regime, and especially the secular authoritarian regimes. So that's, that's one of the challenge. There is no clear answer. Uh, uh, but again, uh, so that's the, in the case of Bahrain, I think that France, but the United States, we have been in favor of political reform. You know, really, you can have between a sort of sweeping uh, referendum that's, saying that's and, and uh, really a sort of opening of the regime, there are different, there are, there are, I guess there is a sort of nuances. I'm not sure that it will work, but it will be better that a sort of stiffening of but the regime. But I agree with you. This is like you said earlier, you know, there is no one system that's going to be applicable to the all Arab states. Each Arab country is going to find its own ways to deal mm -hmm. with, with, the, with some form of reform. 
And uh, as, uh, this is a process that may take uh, years, if not decades, yeah. for that matter. You know, I have so many questions I would love to ask you, but I want to give the audience yeah. an opportunity since you need to leave a little earlier. So we'll take a few questions from the audience. But before I do so, I want you all to recognize one person here who worked so hard in putting this together. Alice in the back there, please give her a big hand. Uh, we'll, take, we'll, we'll take a few questions and uh, we'll uh, take it from there. Uh, a mic here, please. Please limit yourself to a question. We have very limited time. Thank you very much. A few short years ago, the member states um, passed a UN resolution on the responsibility to protect mm. the citizens of a country if their own government fails to do that. And I think in Libya now, this is the first time really that mm. this is being tested. What exactly does the resolution say, besides the fact that there's a responsibility to protect? Is there anything in it that says um, you can leave at a certain point? I mean, you know, where does it go besides just the responsibility? No, yeah. the, the, responsibility the responsibility to protect is a concept which has been introduced. Uh, but immediately, of course, it has been uh, uh, denied uh, by a lot of countries which have seen, you know, let's be, we have had a sort of golden time in the West, which was the 90s. Uh, the, 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 the Soviet Union had collapsed and the West has, it was a triumph of the West. Uh, Russia was uh, weakened and China was not yet powerful. So the, the lot, a lot of concept, of Western concept uh, on all disarmament or human rights, uh, have really been moved forward. After, I guess, the, 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 the Iraq war, we have had a huge backlash. Uh, because of the Iraq war, which has created a, a, a shock, you know, really, uh, you have to understand in the, in the world, it's really, uh, let's be frank, Guantanamo, Abu Ghraib, in a sense, we have lost our moral leadership. You know, really, we are lecturing people about human rights when you have a place which is especially to deny human rights. That really, uh, so, and there was also the fact that behind these noble or these justifiable arguments, you had countries uh, which, in a sense, were asserting their power, new power, like China, India, Brazil, but also Russia was back. So it means that the last 10 years, uh, we have been, with the West, we have been on the defensive. So the responsibility to protect, for instance, you know, we have not succeeded to move by an inch beyond the principle that we got 10 years ago. So it's the first time that actually it's the French uh, who, in a sense, uh, under the cover, uh, really op hoping that nobody will, will see it, have introduced this small concept of uh, responsibility to protect. But for the moment, it's only a sentence. Uh, you know, really, and we want to use it uh, uh, for the coming battles uh, as to say, you know, really, so it's, you know, in a sense, in the United Nations, you have to understand that when you have the big battles of doctrine, you know, we are uh, a minority. The West is a minority. You have a block in front of you. Really, you have a block saying, and, and the block saying, in a sense, you have also to be on the, it's not the good against the bad. In a sense, these countries are saying, you are using the human rights for the defense of your own interest. You have double standard. Look what is happening in Gaza. Uh, look what is happening in your prisons, uh, and so on and so on. And Guantanamo, but also, you know, really, so it's a, it's, a, it's a weapon of the West. So even democracies, because that's the most striking, that democracies, vibrant democracies, like Brazil, India, you know, South Africa, are on the other side. They are not with us. So really, there is this sort of resentment against the West. So if you launch great battle on the principles, you are defeated. But uh, if you are through all the resolutions about the peacekeeping operations, we are, uh, we, we as the UN, we are deploying 120,000 soldiers and uh, civilians in impossible spots where nobody cares and where uh, millions of people died, for instance, in Congo, thousands of, uh, Dozens of thousands of women are raped. It's really, and in the, the, the resolution, the resolutions creating this force, you can introduce your ideas on gender balance, on, on responsibility to protect, and we have moved forward, I think, discreetly, and with the help uh, of Brazil, South Africa, and India. You know, as, as soon, as long as you're not, you are not waving the flag of the West, the great principles, 
uh, I think you can move your ideas. And the responsibility to protect, we did, we did it this way. We, we didn't, because for the last five years, responsibility to protect every general assembly, we, we, don't, we don't succeed to get anything. But here, that's, you know, really, and the countries didn't object to, the, to this idea of responsibility to protect. Sorry to have, really, to go a bit so beyond the question. Uh, uh, Right, right next to you, please. Please limit yourself to a short question. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, what happened, or what is happening with the that uh, special relation of uh, France and uh, France and Germany, which are, have been the backbone of of the, of, 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 of the European Union? Uh, it seems like uh, not only because of Libya, but because of of, of the. Well, I guess you read the, the article in the New York Times of today, and, and uh, it seems like it uh, uh, has been damaged for, for, for good. Yes. Okay. What's your opinion? No, I think the, the, the relationship between France and Germany is, is not an easy relationship. I think every five years or every time that we have a new president or they have a new chancellor, uh, basically people say it's over. It's over because it was, it was the legacy of the war, basically the Franco-German relationship. It was a decision by two countries. You know, really, we were invaded three times in 70 years by our neighbors. Uh, I have been bred, I'm the last generation, uh, I have been bred in the sort of anti-German neuroses, you know, really, in my family, in my, you know, and I have, uh, I think, the last three generations, I have a, a member of my family who died fighting the Germans. So, really, so, so it was a, a, a decision by the two countries, you know, to, to overcome this sort of awful uh, threat. So there was a sort of, so now, of course, uh, I think the mourning period over the war is over. And uh, so, uh, so it's different. The relationship is much more, I should say, rational. Uh, I think that we have our differences. Uh, we, have, uh, we are competitors in, some, uh, in, in different fields. But we are discovering, and our leaders, president or chancellor, are, are, dis are, are discovering after 18 months that actually the, their interest is to work with the, with the French or to work with the Germans. And, but it doesn't prevent us from having, from time to time, good squabbles. Uh, because we have, again, we have for, on nuclear energy, for instance, you know, really on nuclear energy. We are the French, we are a country, we have a nuclear power plant in every garden. Uh, the Germans are, uh, uh, and we want to build uh, a second one uh, in the backyard. Uh, while uh, on the German side, they consider, you know, they consider they have to immediately to close all of them because, so it's, uh, and it, it, it leads to, to real debate in the European Union. Because on climate change, you have the French to say for climate change, oh, we have to say that nuclear power plants are good for, cl for fighting climate change which is true, by the way, but really, and the Germans say, no way, you know, really. So that we have a lot of good squabbles. And uh, on, on Libya, it's one of these examples. And here, in a sense, frankly, uh, the French would be the last one to regret that the Germans are not militaristic. Hi, uh, my name is Diallo Abdullah. I'm an alumni of the uh, School of Continuing Professional Studies. Uh, your Excellency, you stated in your intervention that um, one of your preferred scenarios would be like to have a free and fair election in uh, Libya. Uh, but yet, uh, there's another of your former colony, the Ivory Coast, who had a free and fair election a couple of months ago. And, um, uh, the United Nations has still have a mission there, and uh, around 8,000 French soldiers are on the ground. There's still um, civilians being slaughtered. Uh, what are you doing to oh, th solve the situation? That I'm very happy that you're raising this issue, which is interesting nobody, I guess, in this country. Uh, first, we have only 900 so French soldiers, and there is 8,000 soldiers of the UN, but only 900 French soldiers. Now, Côte d'Ivoire, it's a very striking because um, we had uh, uh, elections, general elections on 28th of November, and it was a clear victory uh, by the candidate of the opposition, you know, his name is Mr. Ouattara. Uh, the, the fact is that the loser is clinging to the power, uh, Bagbo. And uh, uh, it was the uh, end of November, 
and uh, we are closer and closer actually to civil war. And uh, people don't care or don't, well, it's not a question of not caring, but are not informed. I think uh, you have now hundreds, and I guess more than hundreds of, of casualties of civilians killed. Um, you have hundreds of thousands of people who have fled the capital, Abidjan, have been obliged to flee because they are terrorized by the, 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 the gentleman, Mr. Bagbo. Uh, so it's, it's an impossible situation. And uh, so we, the French, I can tell you, at the Security Council, we are uh, really doing our best. Uh, but that's a, a good example uh, also of the limitations of the United Nations uh, forces. Because people, first, uh, we have to, because it's very easy to criticize, it's not only on, on Fox News, but it's, you can criticize the UN, UN forces. But first, you have to say that uh, uh, the Western powers are not providing uh, UN forces. There is not one American soldier, not one British soldier, one, uh, not one German and so on, Italian, uh, not Italian, there are a few ones uh, under the, U, uh, the UN flag. Which means that the UN forces are provided by countries like Bangladesh, Nigeria, uh, Pakistan, and in, in India. And I think we, f we should be first grateful to these countries to, to do it, to provide forces. Uh, we don't do it. That's the first element. Second element, the UN forces, very often people don't understand, the UN forces are not for fighting. When you send a UN force, it's to implement a political agreement. So these, for these forces are, they are not organized, they are not armed for fighting. They are basically here to be, you know, between two enemies or, or to facilitate the stabilization of a country. And here, what we have in, 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 uh, in Abidjan, in Cote d'Ivoire, is you have typically this situation where you had a UN force uh, which was supposed to monitor, facilitate uh, the elections, the political process. And suddenly, law and order is collapsing. You have a war, a civil war. And these soldiers, basically, uh, they are lightly armed. Uh, they don't have, a, the, and in a sense, they have not been sent there to, to, to fight. And so they are a bit overwhelmed. And uh, so the question is, it's, I think your question is legitimate. There are 8,000 uh, soldiers of very unequal quality, let's be clear, and they are doing their best. Uh, but again, they don't have uh, armored vehicles. Uh, they don't, you know, really. So the, 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 the reality is that you can say, well, they are ineffective to, to try to avoid the civil war. So what we, you know, uh, we the French, uh, we want to, on, uh, on Monday, we would want to go for, for a new resolution of sanctions against Bagbo and, and his people. Uh, but there is a strong, very, very strong risk of a civil war. And, uh, and when you know, you have had civil wars in the part of Africa, in Sierra Leone, in Liberia, and there were inimaginable slaughters. And uh, so, it's really for us, you know, especially first we, we were the colonial power, but also we have uh, 14, now I think 12,000 French citizens li living in, in Abidjan. And uh, so we are really extremely worried by what could happen. We are frankly, we are doing our best. Uh, but at the same time, um, you know, it's really, it's, um, some people say, send the French forces, but really, we, we, we were doing it in the 60s and the 70s, and we were accused of colonialism. So now we are in 2011, so we can't do it anymore. We can't simply send French soldiers to get rid of this guy. So we are doing our best, I can assure you, in political terms, in human terms, humanitarian terms. We are helping the Africans because what has changed from the 70s is now that the African countries want to solve the problem. So the, the, the regional organization, which is the, in English ECOWAS, in French CDAO, which is chaired and by Nigeria, is doing its best to try to convince this guy to leave. And also South Africa, by the way, uh, is also trying to do. So we are helping the Africans, Africa to the Africans. So the Africans have to solve the, the crisis, but the, the dangers are, are very high. You know, thank you for the question, you know, to allow me to raise the issue of Côte d'Ivoire. Last, last question. Yes, last one question. More. One more question. Uh, we'll go with you there, please. Your Excellency, my question pertains to uh, the Special Envoy, the Secretary General Special Envoy, Abdelilah Al-Khatib. 
And the question is, do you think um, the Security Council have allowed enough time or a chance for Abdel Ilah al-Khatib to actually try to pursue a dialogue or, or a political solution with Libya before uh, pursuing you know, Security Council Resolution 1973? And quickly, if you could comment on Gaza. Um, just two days ago, Pasco, the, under, the Secretary General Under Secretary, he um, uh, briefed the Security Council and said, you know, uh, pursuing or announcing a, a Palestinian state is essential to the stability in the Middle East given the current situation. Should we, could you give us an idea about the, if, if France has any vision or expectations for the current situation in Palestine or you know, by September, should we expect you know, anything on that front, the two-state solution? Thank you. So on the, the first, I think, on the first item, you know, basically, the question was not giving time. You know, the, 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 the Qadhafi's forces were uh, rushing and entering the suburbs of, of Benghazi. And again, uh, he, he was saying that they will go house by house and that rivers of blood will flow. So we had to intervene. It doesn't mean, as I said, political track, Mr. Al Khatib, uh, who is a Jordanian and who is a special envoy of the Secretary General, it doesn't mean that his mission is over. Uh, actually, he was in uh, very recently in Tripoli. He will be tomorrow in Addis Abeba. Uh, so, he w uh, by the way, Addis Abeba, there will be representatives of Gaddafi and also of the, 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 the National Com uh, Transition Committee of, from, from Benghazi. So he is, you know, really, he has two uh, twofold mission. One is humanitarian access and secondly political. And today in the Security Council, most of the members, all the members, have, have reaffirmed that uh, his mission is still, of course, is still valid. On the Palestinian issue, here we could have two hours ahead of us. Um, really, it's, um, in a sense, uh, how, how to begin, you know, really, it's um, what we, we, you know, the last uh, episode was the American veto on the resolution, which was uh, on uh, resolution wa which was declaring uh, uh, that settlements, uh, uh, Israeli settlements were illegal and an obstacle to peace. Actually, the American administration was uh, vetoing what was its own policy for the last 18 months. That's domestic politics are playing in every country. We are democracies. But so there was a, so here, and in a sense, the, the peaceful, there, it's very difficult to say that there is a peace process now. You don't have negotiations. Um, uh, you have violence coming back. You know, really, you see there, there was this bombing in, in Jerusalem. Uh, you have the Qassam all the time, rockets falling on Israel. And you have the Israelis uh, uh, striking, uh, striking Gaza. And there is no peace process. So there is, it's the perfect recipe for another outburst of violence. You know, really, frankly, it's that really you have all the elements of an outburst of violence. Palestinians desperate on the other side, the violence. You know, tomorrow, an Israeli missile falling on the Palestinian school or a Palestinian rocket falling on an Israeli school and really everything explodes, especially because- Will no France war. vote for the Palestinians? Yes, we voted, a 14 versus one. So no, no, no. Will, if it comes to the General Assembly, will France support the declaration recognition of Palestinian state? No, I think that's, that's I guess... I mean, I, it's going to come. That's it what doesn't, the Palestinians No, 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 really. First, uh, there is, yes, because for, uh, there is the idea that the Palestinians will want to be admitted to the UN. But first, uh, they can't, because uh, to be admitted to the UN, you have first to go through the Security, Security Council. Council and, yes. really, and basically, frankly, it's not the issue. You know, to be admitted to the UN, I'm sure that it's the most expect, it's very exciting, but that's not the issue. The issue is a negotiation between the Israelis and the Palestinians. So the real issue is how we try to, to go back to bring the, these people around the table. Because if we were, you know, we can write down the peace treaty in 15 minutes. You know, the peace treaty, everybody knows what is, what would be a, a peace treaty. You know, really. Uh, of course, in this part of the world, especially in Jerusalem, 100 meters, you can really make a lot of difference. But basically, we know the, the really, we know the parameters of, right. the, of the peace treaty. The problem is the two sides, for their own reasons, the two sides are unable to go to peace by themselves, because it's really again the the the, the, the Palestinian side said, oh, the Israelis are, are responsible. Uh, and it's true, because the, the Israeli, the Knesset, is totally paralyzed, uh, 12 parties, it's totally... You know, people forget that the Oslo Agreement uh, was voted by 61 versus 59. 
you know, really. And it was the Oslo Agreement with Rabin. But the other side, the Israelis said, oh no, the Palestinians are responsible. And the Israelis are right. You know, you have the Hamas. How can you ask the, the Israelis to sign a peace treaty with the Palestinian Authority, which doesn't control uh, uh, half uh, sure. of, the, of the problem? You know, the, the two sides have their own problem. So how to bring the two, the two, how to help the two sides to overcome their own problem and to go to the table of, of, of negotiation? And, and again, uh, nobody has really, uh, has obviously, has, has the answer. What we are trying to do for right now, for the moment, with the French, the British, and the Germans, uh, we are trying to, 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 op to get the endorsement, the public endorsement of the parameters. The famous parameters of the solution, you know, that, you know, two states living side by side uh, in peace and security. The borders on the basis of the 67 line with equivalent swaps uh, for, of, of territories. Uh, security arrangements for Israel. Uh, the, the solution of the refugee problem. You know, you can have, frankly, you can have some parameters. And if you have the parameters agreed by international community, it helps the negotiation because at least you have a basis. And Jerusalem, of course, capital of the two states. You have, uh, you have the parameters to, to launch a negotiation. Uh, but again, uh, we, are, we are trying to, we are doing our best. That's the President Obama who said we should have a Palestinian state in, in September 2011. Uh, that's an American position. You know, it's very new. He said that in September 2010 uh, at, at the at General Assembly, which was very striking. So I guess it's also to the American diplomacy to deliver uh, also. So, uh, so we are expecting what the Americans uh, can propose to reach the, the goal that the, it has uh, actually the American diplomacy has, has, has defined as defined. So again, we are, this conflict is 100 years old, and uh, uh, so it's really, we are trying, we are, again, doing our best. There won't be a solution without three elements uh, outside, which is first, of course, the Americans, who by definition are in a driving seat because it's the only ones that the Israelis are really trusting, and uh, you have two parties, and uh, so uh, you, you, you have to have the Israelis, which means the Americans. Uh, secondly, the Arabs for, I guess, the opposite reasons, not only the opposite reasons, but also because the Arabs can give a lot of things to the Israelis in terms of recognition. You know that Israel is suffering from a deep feeling of, uh, of, of fragility. You know, it's very f striking. Israel is a superpower for the region which is afraid. You know, really, how to handle the, the existential fear of Israel. And I think the, the, Palestine, the Arab states can say a lot about acceptance of Israel uh, a recognition of Israel, uh, Arab embassies in Israel, you can say, and the Europeans uh, also, because Europeans, we can bring also a lot of things in terms of economic association of the new Palestinian state of Israel, or, uh, you know, refugee the, for the refugee problems. So we have to work, uh, to work together. Unfortunately, for the moment, I think we are not, uh, we are not there. I guess the, the, the Palestinians for the moment are more focused on the reconciliation with the Hamas, and uh, because nothing is possible as long as you have two Palestinian, uh, two Palestinian interlocutors. You know, you can negotiate, you can ask by Israel to sign the, uh, a peace with somebody who is not really, uh, who is not representing the both sides. You can say that Israel has its responsibility uh, with, but that's uh, the reason. Uh, so the Palestinians are engaged into, into reconciliation. And uh, Pr Prime Minister Netanyahu has announced that he wanted to make a, a, a peace initiative. So. Let's wait what, what he's going to propose. Because uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, uh, you know, has really, and I think he's he one of the first Prime Ministers of Israel to say that he's in favor of a two-state solution. Really, which was uh, not the first Prime Minister of Israel, no, but the first, first uh, the Minister right. of, uh, of, the, of, of, of the Likud. You know, as Prime Minister of the Likud, you know, he said that he was in favor of, of, of a two-state solution. So let's wait what he's going uh, to propose. And again, on the American side. Well, you've been very, very generous, very eloquent, and thank you so much for taking okay. the time. We're grateful to you. I, I, I have, have to go. go. Yeah, yeah, I know. Oh, thank, you so you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. All the very best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.